Hello. Um, yeah, basically, I was asked to give this talk, and um, my knowledge of this particular subject uh, was a bit of a crash course, really, because um, my daughter was diagnosed with GIST um, five and a half years ago, and we were trying for her to not lose her stomach for um, about four years of that time. Um, because the, the idea was she wasn't very old and all the doctors said if she has her stomach removed, obviously she's not going to absorb nutrition as well and uh, she's got a lot of growing to do. She was only 15 at the time, so recommendation was to try and hold on to her stomach as long as possible. Um, that, that became a situation that wasn't possible any longer. It was an emergency. And so um, having had her stomach removed, um, we then had to figure out how, how to cope after that. So basically this, this talk is based on first-hand experience of trying to cope and some things that we learned along the way which if we'd known them in advance probably would have made life a little bit easier. So it's really, if any of you have had surgery already, you might recognise some of the things I'm going to be talking about and if at some point in the future you should be um, needing to have surgery, then hopefully there'll be a few coping strategies that um, might be beneficial if you know about them now. So, um, sorry, which button? That one? Right, that one. So, um, the two main types of stomach surgery um, uh, that I'm aware of are a partial gastrectomy and a total gastrectomy. And hopefully the diagrams say it all. Um, obviously, you either lose a little bit of your stomach and therefore there's somewhere for food to reside and start to be absorbed. Um, or if you have your stomach completely removed, um, basically you're left with a sort of a thin tube and nowhere for the food to be stored particularly. Um, my daughter's experience, um, when she'd had her stomach removed, um, obviously you're thinking, well, how on earth is she going to be able to eat anything? Because when you see... Um, when I saw her in intensive care, um, basically she was being drip-fed nutrition while she recovered from the operation. But quite rapidly, um, you know, she was... So this, this operation happened in the November, end of November. It was Christmas Day four weeks later. And between the November and Christmas Day, um, she'd initially been on liquid and then semi-liquid. And by the time we got to Christmas Day, she was able to have a mashed-up Christmas dinner. Obviously, a very small mashed up Christmas dinner, but we were all, you know, um, quite um, amazed at how quickly she was able to start eating proper food. But it, it is um, an experiment because the things that you might have been able to eat previously, you suddenly find perhaps you can't tolerate it as well. Um, potential obstacles. Um, that um, obviously Judith had given us quite a lot of information beforehand. So um, Judith was always going on about this thing called dumping syndrome, which until you've experienced it, you kind of don't know what it means. Um, but the sorts of things that you, you will find, um, obviously, because you haven't got a stomach to expand and uh, take the food, you can feel full up very quickly. So it's, it's very easy to start eating something and then feel full before you've actually got anywhere with eating anything. Um, if you overdo it, um, you know, you eat too much, too quickly, and the wrong types of things, um, you can get a lot of pain, indigestion, um, and this thing called dumping syndrome, which is sort of cramping and um, pain, and um, potentially diarrhea if it all goes horribly wrong. Um, and the other potential thing you have to kind of consider is <coughs> weight loss and malnutrition. And I think it was the, the, um, the malnutrition bit, which, you know, you think if you haven't got a stomach, okay, you're not going to be able to eat so much. But the malnutrition bit was the bit we hadn't really thought that much about, and which is the bit which, since um, she had this operation, we've had to focus on really, really, really very heavily. And that's the bit I suppose I'd like to point out mainly to anybody who's um, likely to go ahead with uh, surgery of this type. So the, the causes of those symptoms, um, obviously, when, when you have, um, not, not with all stomach surgery, but with a total gastrectomy, they cut through a thing called the vagus nerve, which is the main nerve which transmits um, signals to your stomach, between your stomach and your brain. So once you've had your stomach removed, you don't feel hunger anymore because the vagus nerve has been cut. Um, the types of... Um, 
cramping and dumping syndrome that um, obviously I mentioned earlier, which um, is manageable. It is manageable, but you have to learn how to manage it. It's caused by food um, leaving uh, or, or entering your small bowel too quickly. Obviously, if you don't have a stomach anymore, um, it goes straight to the small bowel. So you, you're advised to, um, what's the word, to kind of mimic um, food leaving the stomach slowly by actually eating small amounts over longer periods of time. So rather than taking one big meal, eating it all in one go, and then creating a situation where you get this cramping and uh, the dumping syndrome, by eating food slowly in small amounts, grazing effectively over a longer period of time, you can mimic the same effect as food being stored in your stomach and then gradually released into your small bowel. Um, likely causes continued of the, of the things that I described earlier, uh, malnutrition. Um, this was something I learned actually by putting this presentation together. The different parts of your alimentary canal um, absorb different nutrients. So um, obviously they have to go through your whole system and at different points in the system that's where the nutrients are, are absorbed. So um, when you've had your stomach removed, the, the types of things that can happen, one thing, bacterial overgrowth. Um, I didn't know such a thing existed, but it's quite common when people have their stomachs removed to get a thing called bacterial overgrowth. It manifests itself as the most putrid smelling wind. Sorry to have to be so graphic, but it does. Um, but it also means that basically any food that's in your system is, is um, fermenting. And that creates a situation where you can't absorb that food properly. So you get malnutrition, you get very uncomfortable and embarrassing situation, but you can actually, this can actually be remedied quite easily. As I say, having experienced a situation where a patient was in this situation, we didn't know what to do and we were told, first of all, this is how it is when you've had your stomach removed and that's, that's how life's gonna be. But there is a test that can be done um, where you, you breathe into a tube and they, they, they can actually tell you whether um, you've got this bacterial overgrowth and if you have, they will give you some antibiotics and it will clear that up and therefore you absorb your food more effectively and the nutrients and you don't get this uh, side effect with all the other hideous problems that can occur. Um, now, another thing that we encountered, we were, we were told that during the operation um, there had been a slight shaving of the tumour off of um, my daughter's pancreas, but in, there wasn't enough of um, you know, surgery on the pancreas to, for it to be causing any problem. However, it did seem to cause problem because she didn't seem to be digesting any of the food. It was basically um, obvious that she wasn't digesting food. I won't be more explicit. Um, so, yet again, through Judith's recommendation, Judith recommended that she could possibly be not absorbing her nutrients properly because the pancreas wasn't working properly and therefore she might benefit from having some enzymes. Yet again, there was another test which we had to ask for and um, having had that test, um, it was proved that her pancreas was um, not working properly and therefore she would benefit from having a, um, a a supplement called Creon, which effectively d dissolves the food inside her so that it can then be absorbed. Um, so in terms of those things, I think we were, we were going on for probably seven months with a situation where she had bacterial overgrowth and a pancreatic insufficiency, and she seemed to be just disappearing before my eyes, really. Um, but nobody seemed to have any remedies. Um, it was only when we went to the Paul's Gist Clinic, actually, that... <laughs> Finally, we started to get some answers. So, um, obviously, reduced intake of nutrients means you're going to be um, unwell quite rapidly if you don't do something to address it. Um, I have known situations where patients who've not been able to get nutritional support, when they have finally gone to a nutritionist who specialises in people who've had um, sur surgery to the stomach, um, in some cases, they said, look, the only, the only solution we've got is to feed you intravenously because you should have come to us some while ago. So I suppose what I'm saying is, if you, if you ever, or anybody you know, finds yourself in a situation where you've had stomach surgery and you're not um, 
you're not feeling like you're absor absorbing food or nutrients properly, don't just accept that that is how it is. There are ways to actually overcome these obstacles, but um, unless, you, unless you push it, um, you're not necessarily going to get the answers that you need. And it's not acceptable just to say that's it and that's the only thing that can be done. So you do, you do need to, um, when you've got symptoms like this, engage with an expert surgeon, a surgeon who is familiar with stomach surgery and the, the repercussions and who can actually recommend how to address your side effects, such as we have. Um, you do need to engage with an expert nutritionist, and I'm not talking about a dietitian. A dietitian will tell you the types of foods you could try. The nutritionist does um, a panel of blood tests they, they look at what um, you know, the nutrition is within your system and they will supply you with um, supplements to make sure that in addition to what you're currently absorbing from your normal diet, um, make sure that you get the drugs, sorry, the nutrition in terms of um, minerals and vitamins that will supplement your diet because uh, it would be very easy. And I, th I think um, this, is, this is the fear with my daughter. Because of the malnutrition for seven months, um, the fear is that she won't have been absorbing calcium properly, and therefore that will then lead on to uh, a brittle bone type of scenario, which hopefully can be avoided if you take the nutrition properly. Um, engaging with other patients who've had this experience, vital. I mean, Judith obviously has pointed out so many things which, when we've pushed it, finally have been proved to be correct. So um, if we hadn't had that um, input, I think we would have been just accepting how it was. Um, so it isn't sufficient to struggle on and waste away. Um, strategies, um, basically, um, in terms of this new situation you find yourself in, you may discover you've suddenly got a new food intolerance. So Eve can't um, tolerate lactose. So she's using soya milk now because it, it causes the dumping syndrome and um, her body rejects it. Some foods that you might have loved previously, bread and rice and pasta, um, those are all foods that swell up when they're inside you. And if you haven't got a stomach um, or, or the stomach you have is very small, um, obviously they'll swell up and, and make you very uncomfortable. Um, I think Richard had that, didn't you? <laughs> after your operation, a bowl of pasta straight away, and that was <laughs> not a good event. <laughs> it wasn't good afterwards, no. So the, by, by avoidance, I suppose it's just be careful with them. If you like them, take them in small amounts, see how much you can tolerate. Um, strategies continued. Um, eat smaller, high-calorie foods regularly. So um, on this picture I managed to find, obviously there's a full stomach of vegetables, which is only 400 calories. There's a, a small amount of oil, um, that's also 400 calories, but it hasn't filled up the same space. So high calorie food to try and make sure you get plenty in there for the amount of stomach size that you have or don't have. And obviously prescribed vitamins and minerals. Um, obviously when you have I think it's the lower part of your stomach or all of your or stomach removed. Of the small or top of the small intestine. Um, your ability to then absorb vitamin B disappears as well. So B12. 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 So you have to have vitamin B12 injections every three months to supplement that. Um, obviously, you can have antibiotics for the bacterial overgrowth, and enzymes are fairly easy to obtain once you've identified you need them. Um, some other strategies about how to cope with um, an impaired stomach, um, eating and drinking separately so that you don't fill up the space with a lot of fluid only to find, I mean, if you think about it, if you're on a diet, they advise drinking a big glass of water before you eat a meal to reduce the amount you eat. Well, obviously, you're trying to maximise the amount you eat, so don't fill it up with water, make sure you fill it up with food. And sip and don't gulp. Um, keep a food journal, it's always a good idea. Then you can actually identify those things that you're not tolerating because you can see the patterns that evolve and work out what you can and can't eat. Um, and I suppose the main thing is, <laughs> it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, do demand expert help. Experiment with what suits you um, and don't ever give up. You, know, the, you, you might find uh, a year later you can eat bread where you couldn't eat bread before. Um, 
So, I don't know how many of you have experienced anything of this nature or might do in the future, but hopefully that will be of some help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I know it's quite um, an emotional issue for you at the moment, isn't it? I mean, I can say now that Jane's daughter has got a stable weight. I saw her last week, and that's really good news. She's managed to adapt to eating so she's not losing weight anymore, which is great. Um, I think the thing that disappointed me was that the doctors didn't believe the things that I'd been saying. I mean, I've learned the hard way. Um, I knew my food wasn't being properly digested, and I didn't have surgery on my pancreas either, only on my stomach and my spleen, but that's irrelevant. But as far as eating was concerned, I knew my food was passing straight through me, or some of it was. Hands up anybody who's had gut surgery and has been aware of the fact that their food, what they're eating, is not being digested. Yes, yeah, several people, right, that's about half a dozen of you. And often the doctors don't believe you. I think this is quite sad, and perhaps we better raise it with Mike this afternoon. Um, but I know there is interest now in the sort of complicated side effects of gut surgery. It's mu much more than just the fact that your stomach's been messed around with. It's all sorts of other things. I think cutting the vagus nerve, um, or even bits of it, um, that has to happen when you have your surgery, can have all sorts of effects that nobody's actually expecting. Um, but I think it's a question, as Jane said, and it certainly was for me, of trial and error. Hands up if you've had eating problems after surgery, of one kind or another. Yeah, are they still there or have you managed to live with them? You still have some problems. I still have some problems now, and it's, what, 14 years. I can eat bread now in small quantities without dashing to the loo an hour later. Um, very embarrassing. Um, I had this dumping syndrome thing. How many of you know what we mean by dumping syndrome? Same hands are going up each time, <laughs> which is very interesting. Yeah, horrible. I, I could have died on one occasion. I'd eaten too much curry, my own fault. I'm not blaming any of the doctors. It was my fault. It was lovely. I was enjoying it. An hour later, we were on a campsite. I dashed to the toilet block. Diarrhea like, well, yes, you know. Um, I then passed out and vomited with my head in my lap. I came to later and I realized what had happened and I thought, gosh, have I been lucky. I don't think I'd inhaled the vomit that was in my lap, I could easily have done. And I think, you know, that was mega dumping syndrome, and it's horrible. Um, well, it can be fatal, actually, in that sort of situation. So one does need to take it seriously and find out what causes it. And it's not always easy. I mean, it was curry in large quantities, my own stupid fault, but I've had it before on fairly small amounts of bread. One thing I found, just by trial and error, was that traveling in a car after a meal always made me ill. I see some heads nodding. Yeah, nobody warned me. It was just, that's what happened to me. Sorry? I warned you about it, yeah. Yeah, now we've... We've just had a reprint of this booklet, which lists a lot of the problems. It doesn't really deal with a total gastrectomy. Um, for that, we do have a, um, a document, which is downloadable from the website, but we haven't at the moment actually had it printed off, because most of us, fortunately, don't have to live with a total gastrectomy. 
Um, but a lot of this information is here, and it's really patient experience. And I think when um, Sarah was talking about patient information, this is, we are the experts. We live with it. And we can educate the professionals. Are you listening, Sarah? Where is she hiding? <laughs> um, so have you, has anybody got any questions for Jane on, or me, for example, on, on these eating problems? Is anybody still having serious eating problems? I was one of the fortunate ones who made a very quick recovery after having, um, you know, the stuff of parts of part gastro gastroscopy. But one of the problems was I was I made a quick recovery and was allowed home. But the problem is I have a chronic lung disease and was rushed back in with pneumonia. And I was in hospital then for four weeks. And you try eating hospital food. Uh, and I was losing weight, and eventually my surgeon was fortunately coming down to the respiratory ward to see me. And one day he just shouted to the nurse, there's nobody weighing my patient. And I'd lost about two stone. <laughs> was, the problem was the main respiratory consultant was on holiday, and the young guys had been practicing with different antibiotics. So then I was put on a revolutionary new one, and that did make me recover. But my surgeon kept saying to me, Dorothy, just graze on nuts and, then, and crisps. And yeah. I literally survived. Even my daughter-in-law, who's a professional chef, was trying to bring tidbits in. Yeah. But nothing, I couldn't face anything but the nuts uh, and the, you know, the crisps. And I yeah. survived and got out, as I say, about seven stone in weight. But yeah. I survived and, um, and, and all your advice and Michael's advice too have been absolutely amazing. I mean, we had a joke about flatulence once, about I was going on a plane and I was demented as so I would cope. And we had this silly conversation on, on the gist thing about flatulence in flight. Because <laughs> the day we got back, there was a New Zealand research team had been studying it and said the analysis was, just let it rip. <laughs> it, on, on a positive note, it does, if you've had a partial gastrectomy, it does improve over time. I had one uh, five years ago. And the start for me was, well, immediately after the operation, was just liquids. Um, it, it, it's not embarrassing, but it, it was a bit strange for, for me. I'm not a small chap, although racing snake figure is good for the diet as well. But um, I initially had to eat children's meals. So I'd go into a restaurant and with my 18-year-old, well, she's not, she wasn't 18 then, but with my daughter, and we'd ask for a main meal and a, and, a, um, and a child's meal. And they'd always go to her with the child's meal. Uh, no, no, that's for me. Um, but it, it doesn't matter because as long as you know what's good for you and what gives you these bad symptoms, and that's down to you being responsible about it, if you can do that, you'll get through it and it will improve. It's a bit different for full gastrectomy. Jane's daughter, obviously, and others that have had that, that's a different type of thing. And this that we've just heard is very important for that. But, you know, positive mental attitude. I've said it all, all the time. That, that helps enormously. I, I just want to endorse what you're saying. I had a total gastrectomy um, over eight years ago, and um, it was only by contacting the site and um, the help from Judith. But um, having a total gastrectomy really is a bit different, I think, yes. because I've had a few procedures in hospital, and they don't even bother about you. Honestly, I've nearly starved in the hospital. I've rung my husband in desperation. So they, they give you milky teas, and I'm intolerant like Jane's daughter with lactose. But you do get through it, um, and you do start putting weight on, even, even when you haven't got a stomach. But it's the hospitals and the nurses and the aftercare in the hospital, if you're having a procedure, that need educating. Yes. It's not the specialists. I mean... I was in Manchester Oil last, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for the treatment I've had. I've had ablations on my liver and everything. But there's no food. And if you haven't got a family to bring food yeah. in for you, what do you do? It's quite frightening because you, you can cause problems by not eating. Yes. When you haven't got a stomach, you've got to eat. You're cold. You go a bit, sh bit in yourself. You can cause terrible problems. And I think it's the nurses need to be alerted to people without stomachs or partial yeah. gastrectomies. Yeah. I remember the first day I was allowed to eat um, food rather than a semi-fluid diet. What was on the menu in the hospital? 
curry or fish chips? And I said to the nurse, look, I can't eat this. And she said, all right, I'll go and get you a yogurt. Um, but it is difficult. I think you've highlighted a really important point that the hospitals need to be educated on coping with patients who have re serious eating problems. Did you have um, help after your partial? Because I had no advice or anything in the hospital, nothing. I saw a dietitian, but she was absolutely useless. Yeah. She would know. I mean, I think basically dietitians are usually. Uh, their normal clients are either obese or anorexic, and they're not dealing with people who've had gut surgery. Um, I think the nice thing I found was that when I was eating very small meals, I was able to eat all the naughty things, chocolate, cheesecake, um, all the high-fat, wicked, wicked foods that all the sort of healthy eating people tell you you shouldn't possibly eat. Well, that's just what I needed because they were the high-calorie foods that I could get a lot of nutrients in in a small space. Sarah. Um, I was t uh, talking recently at an upper GI nurse specialist meeting up in the Northwest, and um, they, I think things are changing slowly. I think that they were talking a lot about um, identifying patients who are having this kind of surgery and looking at um, pre-surgery, um, looking at their nutritional status and doing a proper assessment. They've got a really, really good, over at Hope, um, just the other side of the city, Salford, they've got a really, really good um, upper GI um, new, uh, dietitian, actually, she's brilliant. And she does a lot of um, work with patients pre-surgery, um, looking at their BMI, looking at all sorts of um, aspects of what they're eating. And also she does a lot of work with carb loading patients and they have all these special things that they do before they go in to surgery. And actually then post-op as well. So, you know, the aim is to not only try and maintain your nutritional status, but you've also got to think that if you're not eating properly and you're malnourished, then you're not going to heal either. So... Um, you know, they're finding that they are getting patients out of hospital quicker because they're healing better because they're, you know, they're doing a bit of work. So I think it is changing, but it is quite, it, it's slow, I think. It, it's sad for me to hear mm. comments that today, we've heard quite a few people say, I haven't got, mm. didn't get the backup from mm. my uh, surgeon or from whoever about what I do with no stomach or with a partial stomach. Um, and people that haven't or don't even know who their um, specialist nurse, nurses are. What I can assure you from a Just Support UK perspective is that we're doing all we can to make GIST something that every doctor, nurse, GI specialist thinks about and the support that the patients need uh, will, will come from the literature and from the information that we provide. And the more that we're able to tell all of these specialists that there is information out there, hopefully the less we'll hear that you're not getting the support. But everybody in this room that goes to see their own specialist and nurse, if you take some literature with you and give it to the, the, your, either your specialist, your oncologist, anybody, anybody that you meet, that will just improve the awareness of this rare cancer and will help enormously in making sure the number of people that don't get the support get the support. Yes, and just to the point of interest, if you want to automatically uh, get a better quality of food when you go into hospital, just ask for the halal menu and you will definitely, seriously, you'll get a better standard of food. I'm surprised that you know, individuals mention it. It's obvious. I mean, I don't mean to be unkind about the... NHS, but you couldn't eat that rubbish that they give you. So naturally, family are going to help out. But if you want a better quality, just ask for the halal menu. If you don't like it, don't have it. Right. Yeah, so I look, think. Look how informed we are in this group. Right? Yeah. Well, I have to say, I know you're knocking hospital food. I was an inpatient at the Marsden, and for reasons I won't bore you with, I'd missed lunch. And it was the first day I actually felt like eating after my liver surgery. And the Marsden has a menu that they will 
a, a list of things that they will provide at any time. And I ordered poached cod in mushroom sauce. And 20 minutes later, I got on a plate a beautifully prepared piece of poached cod in mushroom sauce. It was delicious. Cooked to order. Now, I don't suppose all hospitals have that, but I, I was so impressed. I couldn't eat all of it. I ate half of it, and David ate the other half. Um, <laughs> but I know we knock the NHS food, but there are, there are examples where it, it does. For me, that was amazing.